Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, Geary um, seminar. Today, I'm delighted to develop or to introduce Dr. Nuala Whelan, who is a postdoctoral research on a project that has just finished at Maynooth on a collaborative approach to building a public employment service um, at the Maynooth University Social Science Institute. Uh, Nuala is also a chartered work and organizational psychologist who has worked for 20 years as a practitioner in community-based employment services with clients disadvantaged in the labour market. Her main interests centre on employability, employment service effectiveness, career guidance models practice, collaborative working, policy implementation, and the potential value of enhancing human capacity for personal, organisational and societal uh, impact. So today, um, Nuala is going to be talking to us about some of her research work, which is on challenging times, governance and practice of activation and employment guidance in Ireland. And as we usually do each week, uh, questions will be taken at the end of the seminar and through the, the Q&A format. So without further ado, Nuala, over to you and thank you. Thanks, Doran. Um, so hi, everyone. And uh, just uh, thank you to Darren and the Geary uh, Institute for the invitation to present today's seminar uh, on the work of the ACAPES project. So um, it's very timely. Um, as Darren mentioned, our project finished last Friday. So um, hopefully I can share some of our uh, the progress we made and some of our uh, outcomes with you today. Um, so I've been working for two years uh, with my colleague, Professor Mary Murphy at Maynooth University and also in collaboration with Dr. Michael McGann, who spoke to you uh, a couple of weeks ago on his work on um, governing activation in Ireland. Um, and uh, we've also been working in collaboration with our project partners, um, our advisory group, um, with representatives from the INOU, the Local Employment Service, and the ILDN. So just to get uh, those names mentioned before I kick off. Um, Okay, so I suppose this project really was conceptualized at a time um, pre-pandemic uh, when Ireland had dropped, its, its unemployment rate had dropped from the uh, post-recession um, high of over 15% down to approximately 4.7%. So uh, really Ireland was experiencing, I suppose, a period of, of full employment in many ways. Um, However, we were very aware that there were a number of important document or policy documents which were promoting the idea of um, a strong and resilient uh, labour force. And we were aware that uh, recent research by NESC on jobless households had identified a number of challenges that um, experienced by job seekers and people who uh, households where there was a low intensity of work. Um, so some of their the challenges and this diagram I think by NESC is, is very very useful diagram I often use it in presentations but to show kind of what were the enablers and then the the challenges uh, experienced by job seekers uh, and my own PhD research at the time had also kind of indicated the the uh, often low skills of long-term unemployed groups um, there are low levels of digital skills and basic skills and also high levels of psychological distress or, or really low well-being experienced by a, a long-term unemployed cohort in North Dublin. So we were very conscious of that space. And we wanted to then really understand the kind of the constituent parts of the public employment. We knew that while the predominant uh, parts of the employment service were the entry of service, the local employment service, the job path uh, providers, employability, jobs clubs, uh, that there were various other small services operating around the country um, in, in services that weren't predominantly employment focused. So these were um, services perhaps um, for people experiencing homelessness who would have somebody supporting uh, their clients uh, to access labour market opportunities. So we were conscious of this kind of picture um, at the time. Uh, so this was pre-pandemic. And I suppose maybe just to contextualize it a bit now that still we feel our, our, we've tried to adjust uh, some of the research um, to, to make it relevant uh, in, our, in our, current, um, our the current time that we're experiencing. So we know at the moment that uh, the unemployment rate is about 7.3%. 
uh, just under 50,000 people um, who've been long-term unemployed for, for over a year. Um, but when we add in people who have become unemployed uh, as a result of COVID and are in receipt of some kind of uh, COVID payment, that shoots up to 12.4%. Um, and the young unemployed um, still experiencing very high levels of unemployment. So uh, we're very conscious that we're um, into a different uh, world of unemployment uh, than we were in when we started this project. So our project was very much focused on the leaving no one behind agenda. And I suppose that's still very relevant now that really we're trying to think of a public employment service that can uh, not only deal with the challenges um, we've been faced with as a result of the pandemic, but also in terms of future challenges that may impact the labour force. So challenges that may come from climate change, from globalisation and from this kind of incre increased maybe digitalization of the labour of the, the world of work. Um, and really the, the, the key, I suppose, that we're trying to, to tap into is to find the mechanisms that will support all unemployed people uh, to find uh, good and uh, good work and sustainable access to the labour market. Um, so our research really uh, is very um, relevant uh, in the current moment as well. Um, as Darren said, my background uh, is in uh, psychology, in work and organisational psychology and in working in the employment services. Um, but I also work in a, in a, a sociology department. So again, very much aware of the, more, the macro picture and the, the, the more structural issues facing people. Um, but I suppose from my own experience uh, of working in the employment services, uh, I've always been struck by how people present the services uh, in terms of their well-being. And we know that from research that uh, employment brings with it financial reward. Uh, it helps us to structure our day and provides us with social contact. It gives us opportunities for skill development and uses our individual abilities and aptitudes and of course provides us with physical and mental activity. And I suppose we can even, all of us have got a sense, uh, even from remote working over the past 18 months or so, how some of these um, benefits that we get from work have been impacted um, uh, in terms of maybe working from home and not being in that work environment. Uh, so when we experience unemployment, that brings with it then financial penalties, of course, so impacting our our finances and our ability to maybe then interact to the same extent in society as we would have previously. Um, it has an impact on our skills in terms of them becoming depleted over time. It impacts our personal view of ourself or our self-identity, but also has societal impacts in terms of stigma and how we may now perceive ourselves within society and possibly how others perceive us. And of course, then it has a uh, physical and mental health and well-being impacts. And there are well-documented research over the years to show these uh, psychological uh, and physical health impacts, but also the impact on re-employment. Um, research has linked unemployment with over 100 psychological variables. And uh, we know that the unemployed experience lower levels of well-being than people who are in employment. Um, and these effects are often multiple. Um, so Generally, people might not just present with psychological distress, but that often impacts maybe their, their confidence, their self-esteem, and their feeling that they can uh, find a place in the world of work again. Um, and as I said, these are well documented uh, over many years. Lots of very, very nice, nice <laughs> in a way that they are very descriptive accounts of joblessness. Uh, Yehoda, Seligman, Goldsmith, and so on. And really from the 1980s, a huge amount of evidence um, presented by research on the impact um, of unemployment on our well-being and how our re-employment or our ability to become re-employed re or reattached to the labour market is really impacted. And often a lot of this has come from um, improved um, uh, analytic uh, methods um, to enable us to, to provide that strong evidence. Um, and importantly, I think, uh, and this is what makes the, the whole uh, area of supporting people um, back into work so complex, is that we all experience unemployment in different ways. So 
depending on our age, our gender, the length of time we've been unemployed, um, perhaps the local levels of unemployment in our area, um, the prevailing views of unemployment in society, our personal variables and our uh, variables and our values and belief systems can all be impacted and can all contribute to the way in which we experience unemployment differently. Um, and I think important to mention is that uh, in much of the literature on unemployment, uh, poverty is always uh, uh, plays a part in uh, trying to understand people's experiences of unemployment. And of course, the poverty brings with it its own impacts and its own um, um, uh, well-being impacts on well-being. Uh, so what, what do we try to do about all of this? What, what do governments do? Um, how do we try to improve the situation for people? So generally, labour market policies try to, to, to tackle this uh, and try to ameliorate some of these negative impacts. Um, they're the most active labour market programmes then are the most commonly used methods of trying to uh, support people back into work. And the activation literature on employability uh, typically distinguishes between two different types of models. Um, the work first activation model and the human capital development model. So work first tends, it prioritizes this rapid return to the labor market and is based on the assumption that any job is better than no job. And we know that this isn't true <laughs> uh, from lots of research looking at poor work and how that has uh, negative psychological impacts uh, for people uh, similar to those experienced by the unemployed. Um, and the other model then is the human capital development model, and that tends to focus on education and training, so facilitating skill and competence development to help people improve their uh, more sustainable access to the labour market. Um, however, both of these are associated with um, welfare benefit conditionality, and we've seen in recent years this kind of uh, um, shift internationally towards these more regulatory forms of activation policy. So um, rather than using policies that enable people to access the labor market, uh, that those enabling uh, characteristics seem to be becoming uh, less evident in the policy picture. And in fact, the more regulatory forms uh, of activation are becoming more pronounced. Uh, so this is where uh, benefit rules are attached to, to uh, uh, the unemployed's participation in uh, labor market or employability interventions. And we've seen uh, Ireland's activation turn really over the last 10 years or so. Um, and I was thinking about the, it's, it's just now just uh, in the last day or two as I was preparing for this, thinking about uh, Ireland, Ireland's decade of pathways to work. So 2011 saw the introduction of the pathways to work um, policy to try and reduce those very high levels of unemployment um, post uh, the great financial crisis. So we've had a decade now of uh, various iterations of the pathways to work policy. Um, so Ireland moving from a very much more passive activation system or a labor market policy system in the 80s, 90s and 2000s uh, to something that's far more um, about uh, progressing people quickly into work um, and we know this because the, uh, the uh, outcomes that are counted as successes in terms of our labour market policy, so in terms of the local employment service, for example, or job path, that outcomes are measured on returns to employment. Um, and I suppose in this project, we're also very aware of the, um, the European research on career guidance and employment guidance. So um, this focus at a European level on the benefits of career guidance and, their, and the important role that career guidance plays in educational and uh, employment systems. So there's a, uh, they promote this uh, lifelong and continuous, um, um, I suppose, interaction with the career guidance. So seeing it as important across our lives as we move in and out of work, as we're faced with different challenges, as, as work changes, that it's important to have access to good quality career guidance. 
and it really does have significant personal, social, economic and work-related benefits. Um, more recently, um, there was a joint statement by CEDEFOP, the OECD, ILO, UNESCO, the European Commission and the ETF, encouraging governments to invest in career guidance. Um, and this quote just in blue here on the screen, um, they say that, that career guidance are services which help people of any age to manage their careers and to make educational training and occupational choices that are right for them. It helps people to reflect on their ambitions, their interests, their qualifications, skills and talents, and to relate this knowledge about who they are and who they might become within the labour market. So really uh, a high vision um, to, to enable people uh, see themselves as part of the labour market and to fulfil their potential. Um, so we were very interested in this idea and uh, how I suppose the local employment services uh, has been the service since 1996, which has kind of promoted a more the use of a career guidance model in how they deliver their services. So we were very interested in looking at that and how activation maybe has changed, um, how they deliver those services um, and what that means for the public employment services and for people who are unemployed. Um, so I think it's important to remember that um, people who are experiencing unemployment um, will not have access to career guidance unless they're referred into the education and training uh, um, side of things, um, unless they specify that they are interested in education and training, and then they will get career guidance through the adult guidance service, for example. Um, so while the, the local employment service has traditionally offered this uh, in our pathways to work model of labour market policy, this has been less the focus uh, and more there's been a more administrative focus to how the local employment services deliver their services so we were interested in developing this kind of theoretical foundation and an evidence-informed public employment service model that was capable of meeting the need of all job seekers and helping people to or enabling them to be have more sustainable access to the labor market in the future so uh, our research, our method really was we went out, well, I went out thankfully uh, in 2019, pre-pandemic, to observe, document and map practice in a sample of local employment services around the country, uh, speaking to practitioners, to stakeholders, um, using focus groups and semi-structured interviews to capture and detail the client needs, the service goals and the guidance approaches that were used, uh, and using a kind of a realistic research strategy um, that really uh, helped me to look at why interventions work and what types of resources those interventions offer that enable uh, the participants to uh, move into a, a world of work or see themselves in a world of work. So really trying to understand the program mechanisms um, and how they impacted on the person's progress uh, towards the world of work. So I mapped the practice and we came up with a conceptual framework, uh, which led then to an employment guidance practitioner toolkit and a measurement tool to capture outcomes. So, um, sorry there. Um, so in terms of looking at the practice uh, in the LESs, um, we found really that the practice uh, wasn't a career guidance, the traditional type of career guidance model, um, but it differed in many ways in that uh, it was more of a specific form of career guidance that was really trying to help individuals improve their employability. And that is that they were, uh, the practitioners were working with the clients to enable them to gain and maintain a job in a formal organization and become self-sufficient in the labor market. And the practitioners spoke about the many personal attributes that they would deal with uh, in, their, in their practice. So helping people with self-esteem issues, with confidence issues, uh, with seeing themselves uh, within the world of work and as having a role in the world of work. So ways helping them uh, achieve their, their ambitions and their dreams uh, and so on, uh, employment related. But again, then dealing with the social context within which people were uh, living, the environmental context. So some of the other things that were happening in their lives that were perhaps, um, you know, 
presenting as challenges to them accessing um, decent work. And then the structural issues um, around, you know, maybe childcare or transport or these other issues that were uh, in preventing the person from accessing work and being aware then of the economic um, situation. So uh, when we think about employment guidance, Arnkel and colleagues uh, have a very nice toolkit for public employment services in um, developing career guidance within the services. And they talk about employment guidance as uh, assessing, developing, um, uh, helping people with career management, co you know, career management skills, using coaching um, and so on to enable people to access the labor market. Um, so this really led us uh, to our conceptualization of employability. And as I've mentioned earlier, the work first activation and human capital development models, they really focused on reactivating discouraged workers uh, back into employment, but for the, the benefit of the economy with very little uh, focus on their well-being or their preferences. So these, their well-being and preferences were seen nearly as secondary, uh, that the work uh, moving the person into work was seen as the primary uh, role of, of these um, types of policy approaches. Um, and we wanted to look beyond that um, and see what were the alternatives, what other uh, models may enable people to uh, improve their well-being and to, to follow those uh, ambitions and dreams and visions and become more uh, uh, secure in, their in the labour market uh, into the future. Um, so our, the, the next model that we looked at was the work-life balance model. And this is really informed by uh, capability theory, so SEND's model of capability, and it, recognizing me it recognizes meaningful work um, as a key component of well-being. It emphasizes people, uh, in Orthon's words, to lead the life and perform the job that they have reason to value. And we really felt that that was what uh, the, the practitioners and the, the clients that we'd met through our work with the LES that we're trying to do. Uh, we looked further than that at what, what other options are, are available. So the life first model um, as described by Dean and colleagues, and this really goes beyond uh, these three models. It's a more approach. It prioritizes life needs as well being enhancing uh, above the, uh, the obligation to work. So work may not even be seen uh, as the priority here. Um, if it's well-being enhancing, then it may be. Uh, so we looked at these models um, and we, we looked at what other researchers um, had, how they had detailed out these models. And uh, Lindsay and colleagues, Boosie, uh, Dean, had looked at work first and human capital development model predominantly uh, in terms of their rationale, their program targets, uh, the relationship with the individual and their engagement with the individual. Um, and what types of employability these models lead to. So our contribution here really was to look at detailing those out in terms of what actually happens in terms of the practice and the role and extent of employment guidance within each of those conceptualizations of employability. Um, so we can see the work first activation model really promotes a, a, a job matching type um, em employment guidance, uh, so the job fit, the, the person environment fit model uh, is often the, the type of or the, the extent of the uh, employment guidance that's possible within a work first model. Within the human capital development model, um, the focus on education and training, but generally to meet the needs of the labour market rather than being well being enhancing or uh, in terms of building, you know, in, building the potential of the individual. The work-life uh, balance flourishing model um, kind of goes beyond this. It relies on, on good triage to understand the needs of the client um, and also the, the context that the client is within, so their co social context. And it uses narrative and developmental approaches to career guidance or employment guidance to really try and help the individual to um, develop career plan and build a more sustainable access to the labor market across their life. 
um, and the life first, then, as I said, a holistic approach uh, and really goes beyond this and looks at uh, the intersectionality of challenges faced by the individual. And as I said, uh, uh, build a, a career uh, path, but indeed uh, work may not be the most appropriate um, intervention or uh, next step for the person at that time. Um, so we then looked at the type of employability that each of these lead to. Um, and some of this work, as I said, has been uh, already um, focused on uh, in terms of the work first and human capital development model. So functional employability and fostering employability. Uh, and we wanted to move, move beyond that and look at enabling employability and empowering employability. Um, so really from there, decided that the most pragmatic approach uh, or the most pragmatic model and definitely in terms of the work that we'd seen the LESs do was to develop a model based on the work life um, flourishing work balance at uh, work life balance model of employment guidance and this really does offer holistic support a tailored approach co-production um, so with services with other services but also with the client a robust triage to really identify uh, what the needs of the individual are and uh, led by professional employment guidance uh, practice and operating within an interagency model. So drawing on specialist services to support the individual while they're on their journey towards the labor market. And from this then we've developed a toolkit for practitioners and services, uh, a metric that uh, enables the client, the practitioner and the service to look at the sub outcomes achieved um, as a result of the person's interaction with the service and a poster then that can help practitioners and guide their practice. Um, so these are just some screenshots of the uh, toolkit. And in the toolkit, uh, we have, we talk about defining employment guidance. So what it is, and then how that fits into a capability-led uh, work-life balance uh, employment guidance model. Uh, section four is the section that will probably be mo of most interest to practitioners in that it details out the delivery of this work-life model of enabling employment guidance, uh, focusing in on six stages of a process and the types of activities, um, questions, useful tools and approaches that can be used at each of those stages. Um, and then section five looks at the implementation of the service. So trying to move more towards uh, the managerial level, how could a service like this be implemented and the environment that enables people to flourish and develop their employability. And section six then looks at evaluation. So I do have a link to the toolkit at the end of the presentation, uh, which may be useful for uh, some of you to look at. Um, so this is the practice poster, and um, as you can see, start, if we start there, it kind of it details out the six stages of the, the MEG, the Model of Enabling Employment Guidance uh, process for practitioners. So you can see uh, on the right-hand side here, the, the pink, so starting at the welcome and information session, so um, introducing the service to the client, helping to develop trust, uh, the client trusting the service and developing a rapport with their guidance practitioner. Then the practitioner moves on to the second stage, which is really around a detailed personalized assessment to identify individual needs. So this is uh, the practitioner using their, their active listening skills to, to hear what the client is saying about themselves, their previous experiences, their view of themselves, the challenges that they face in their everyday lives, and particularly in terms of their ability to access a good job or to, to move out of the world of unemployment. Um, then moving on to career exploration. So trying to tap into what the client would really like to do and to design a tailored guidance process that will enable the, the client to explore their own abilities, their natural abilities, uh, their personality characteristics, who they can be, uh, going back to the quote from the, uh, the joint statement, uh, who they would like to become in the labor market. Uh, the next stage then looks at career decision-making. making So um, 
trying to help the client to uh, make a well-informed decision. So the idea really here is that the, the client, this is a, a collaborative process where the client now takes over the, the driving seat um, and uh, can start making career decisions. However, those career decisions are based on uh, uh, an exploration phase, good information, advice and guidance that they've, um, they've received so far from the service. And then supporting the person to implement the plan. So often this is where uh, challenges uh, arise for the person in terms of their everyday life. Um, and so how can the practitioner work with the client to enable them to overcome some of those challenges, uh, to find the supports that they need to access to enable them then to, to put their career plan into action. And then the ongoing um, maintenance, I suppose, of um, the person's career plan, uh, enabling them to access other supports that may now be necessary for them to stay in work or to move up um, along their, their career plan. Uh, perhaps get a promotion, change jobs, all of these different types of transitions that we face in the labor market, but to be able to support people if they need that support to stay in, um, in the world of work. And we were very conscious again that within that kind of broader system that there, that many services operate in an interagency way, working with other services in their local community uh, to enable them to, to, to fulfill their role in terms of supporting the person into work and um, tapping into specialist services that are available, making referrals when it is right to do so, um, because remembering that this is an employment guidance model and that often people need other services to help them uh, with other challenges in their lives and linking with employers. And we, we felt that employers were kind of key to this, to making this work. Uh, so local employers and engaging with local employers uh, to enable people to, I suppose, help people build up their social capital uh, and having often, uh, my, in my experience, people just don't have access to employers. Uh, they don't have access to sit down with an employer to understand what an employer might need. So enabling that access uh, and creating spaces for that to happen. Uh, so this is a, a poster that can be hung on a wall in an employment service. It can be used as a desktop checklist. It can be used as a, as a way of working with the client. Um, and then, as I said, section five of the toolkit really looks at implementation. So what are the key um, implementation uh, factors that a, a manager may have to think about in terms of the principles of employment guidance? service delivery, what are they? What kind of skills should my practitioners have to enable this service to work well? Um, one of the key things that we found um, from our interactions with the LES was the sense of a community of practice, uh, sharing information, sharing knowledge, sharing practice and experience, really, really important uh, in terms of practitioners, um, CPD, and, uh, and feeling part of something bigger. Um, the guidance setting, the time taken, and so on. So all of these important um, principles, I suppose, of implementing a uh, quality-driven employment guidance service. Uh, we've also developed then a two-day training pilot uh, for practitioners in implementing, in, in delivering the model, but also in terms of thinking about the service that you operate in and how you might implement an employment guidance uh, practice within that service. Um, then the final part of, I suppose, our, our toolkit is a measurement tool. And again, we were very struck by um, practitioners um, when they talked about the types of issues that they face uh, with their clients every day in their work. Um, so the, the clients, uh, Often it's around becoming more aware of yourself in terms of your career, career related self knowledge, um, your social capital, your sense of meaning. So this kind of these kinds of uh, important factors that contribute to our sense of well being and work. Um, other than attitudinal factors like hopefulness, goal setting, self belief, adaptability, resilience, uh, important attitudinal factors related to employability, and then the structural and future employment um, issues. So we've developed a, a questionnaire that um, tries to tap into these um, 
the focus is for the client to be able to see how much progress they've made, perhaps, uh, since they've started interacting with the service. Um, and this can in itself help people in terms of their sense of well-being, their confidence, uh, their belief in themselves, um, and so on. Um, but also to support the practitioner in terms of maybe identifying areas uh, where there are still challenges and what types of interventions or suggestions they could make to help the person overcome those challenges. And then thirdly, in terms of the services themselves, to be able to see the type of progress that clients make and the type of impact that their service is having. Um, because as I said earlier, that the only measure of uh, the success of many of these services are returns to employment, to full-time employment. So this measurement tool tries to tap into those sub outcomes, uh, these steps that we know clients take every day as a result of their interaction in services that aren't ever measured. Um, so really, really important in our understanding of the experience of unemployment, but also in understanding what works and what we can do to improve that. Um, so I suppose what we've tried to do is develop a model for a contemporary public employment service that is very aware of the leave no one behind challenges. So the types of challenges that uh, many clients face, uh, many people face in terms of uh, reaccessing the labour market. And importantly, I think in this post COVID era where we've, we hear it, uh, we've been hearing it for quite a while about the uh, unemployment related distress or even the employment related distress that people have experienced and understanding then how services can promote positive mental health, reemployment and career sustainability for all job seekers. And this is really fundamental in any public employment service design and labour market policy and should become the vision uh, if we really want to help people back into work uh, and to have positive experiences and well-being enhancing work uh, this really should be the focus of where we want to go uh, i just have a picture there of one of our publications from the acapes project the high road back to work uh, which was published last year so uh, it's also available on the website um, which is on the very first slide uh, the opening slide uh, all of the resources and um, uh, from the project are available there. Um, but I suppose go just going back to the idea of a contemporary PEZ, um, we really recognize that previous risks continue to exist. So there is still a cohort of people um, pre-pandemic who were experiencing long-term unemployment and to recognize that they, they uh, still exist and still will require um, quality driven services to enable them back to work and that we're now in an uncertain future uh, and we know this even from the kind of more dualized labor market that we're seeing this kind of shift to remote working that some of us can do it some can't uh, so a new work environment uh, that we're in um, and also recognizing then the experiences of the employment services that they're dealing with this intersectionality of challenges um, that there's an emphasis on job placement that there is a battle between the administration and the type of guidance and uh, employment guidance that can be offered uh, to clients. Many of the services are still operating in a kind of a hybrid model of uh, digitalized um, and remote working with clients and some clients coming into the service and also then the time that's required to, to deliver this. And just my final slide here really is to just kind of tie it up by saying that we, we've really tried to go beyond this idea of activation to offer an alternative approach uh, to the public employment service, a, an approach that's informed by capability theory, by career guidance theory, employment guidance practice, career first approaches, and more collaborative and well being enhancing services. Um, very much, I suppose, informed by a social justice uh, ideology. Um, and that we're trying to promote. Um, a broader public employment service that's informed by these models, helping people then to access decent work and more sustainable employment, um, particularly those who are more distant from the labour market. And just finally, where to find the resources. So I have some uh, websites there. The, the MEG model, the toolkit, uh, is available at the Activation Ireland uh, site, um, also on the INOU website and um, 
soon to be available on the ILDN website. Uh, a link there to our publication on the enabling role of employment guidance in, in contemporary public employment services, uh, which you may find interesting, and my own email address. So please do contact me um, if you have any questions or would like any more information. Uh, and just finally to say that our MEG toolkit, our MEG outcome measurement tool is currently in a, in a, a pilot phase and we hope to have uh, some uh, the psychometric evaluation of that, that uh, uh, MEG questionnaire by uh, early 2022. So I'll leave it there and 